Welcome to date number two. Welcome You've back. made it this far. Yep. Your marriage <laughs> has never looked brighter. <laughs> so we're talking about trust and we've entitled date number two trust factor yes. because in any kind of relationship, if you don't have trust, the truth is you don't have anything at all. Yep, it's true. So we are diving into fun content today that I think really helped Joel and I understand how to have a deeper level of trust in our relationship, in our marriage, and really helped us navigate, I think more than anything, navigate conflict. Um, And just process information better in our marriage, which is super important. And it's kind of like when you, when we talk about trust, it's kind of like when you are first married, you have what we like to call predictive trust or what some people call predictive trust. This is behavior based trust. Yeah. So for example, when you consistently show up on time, I can predict your behavior is that you're going to be on time because your behavior has shown me predictively that you're going to be on time, right? Or the opposite is true. You show up late all the time. I have predictive lack of trust that you're going <laughs> to be on time. And so it's a it's kind of a surface level trust to your relationship that you build early on in your relationship. A trust that's solely based on behavior. So as you get to know each other, as you're maybe a year or two into marriage, your trust is based off of the behaviors that you see inside of one another. But there's actually a deeper level of trust that you can build inside of your relationship that we've experienced will take you to new levels in your marriage and really help you work through communication and conflict in a way better way. Yeah, predictive trust is kind of like the on ramp to trust. Yes, that's great. Way but to there's a there's it. a deeper there's a deeper level that healthy marriages have to have, and not yeah. only healthy marriages, but if you want your your marriage to synergize, yeah, that's to a great be way to the it. marriage that you dreamed of, you have to move to a further level of trust, and it's called vulnerability based trust. That sounds very scary. I know. It's but it's not as scary as it sounds. I promise. Well, here's the scary part about it is that you have to be able to show your weaknesses and admit yeah. your mistakes. So that's a different level of trust. Yeah. It's it's a it's creating an atmosphere in your marriage where there's no fear of repercussion. Yeah for being vulnerable, yeah. for um, saying, okay, I'm not really good at that. You're much better at yeah. that. And so why don't you do that? And I can do this where I'm strong at and the whole team can win. Yeah. And I think we talked about this last week, which I love. It's, you have to see marriage. It's not selfish. It's not about me. It's not about Joel. It's about the team winning. Absolutely. And so when you see it in about the team winning, you can approach this very differently. And um, I love the concept of understanding, you know, oftentimes when we think about the way that our spouse is wired, we want to make them in our own image, right? That's true. Like oftentimes the Especially way- in the beginning of our marriage. Yes. Where it would be like, (laughs) you don't see this? How come you don't understand this? This is the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, and we say early on in our marriage, but that sometimes is like, like, how can you not see this? But it, it helps understand that our spouses are not wired the way we're wired. We are wired differently. And I think oftentimes early on in our marriage, we would hit conflict or not even conflict, but just barriers in our communication because I didn't see the world the way that Joel did. I didn't process information the way he did and vice versa. The truth is we're just wired differently. And so we are gonna dive into, last week we had you take your Myers-Briggs personality test, your 16personalities.com. And what we're gonna unpack is core differences in personalities that when you understand the strength and the weakness of the way you're wired, you can learn to complement one another and not necessarily make allowances for that weakness, but understand that they're wired differently. They don't process information the same way that you do. And instead of utilizing that as a weakness in your relationship and in your marriage, you can actually use it as an incredible strength 
to function yeah. stronger as a team in your marriage. So and let's that's where, in. Yeah, that's where the synergy begins to yes. happen. So yes. if you haven't gone to 16personalities.com and taken the test, you can just pause this video pause right video. now. Go take the quick test. You can do it on your smartphone or uh, on your computer. it's fun. It's fun. Like, don't let the test stress you out. Some people are so yeah. weird about personality tests, and I get it. You feel like it's going to, like, put you in a box. But don't. Don't feel that way. Take the test. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to learn about yourself. Yes. So let's dive into the first uh, characteristic of the Myers-Briggs personality test. And it's I and E yep. or E and I, extrovert and introvert. And an extrovert primarily focuses and is concerned with the external world around them. So yep. all of you extroverts out there, you social butterflies, you're concerned <laughs> with what's happening on the external world, where the introvert is more focused and concerned with the internal world, yeah. those deep stoic thinkers out there. Yeah, so extroverts are oftentimes fueled by being around people. And that doesn't mean that you don't refresh by being alone, but people energize you. Yeah. They give you energy. I'm an extrovert. Joel is kind of a little bit of both, I feel I'm like. I'm an extrovert, but I'm closer to the yeah. introvert line. And yeah. again, like none of us are 100%. Yeah. We're all fall somewhere in the spectrum between the two. Yeah, absolutely. And oftentimes extroverts, we think as we speak. We process out loud, which can get us in a lot of trouble um, in every relationship that we have. But we're for, oftentimes extroverts are verbal processors. And yes. introverts yes. are internal processors. Yes. They think first and they speak later. And oftentimes extroverts, um, they express themselves very well verbally. And introverts yes, express yeah. themselves very well in written form. And so you can see how you've got an extrovert fueled by being around people, an introvert fueled by being alone. An extrovert who expresses themselves very well verbally, sometimes we can have diarrhea of the mouth. Like literally everything, I process out loud all the time, in the shower, in the car, like if I think it, I speak it oftentimes. And introverts, they need time to process that information. They're internal processors and they process things better in written form. Now, where that can be huge when it comes to your marriage is you take in and process information differently, right? And so sometimes like me, I wanna talk about it right away. Like if I feel yeah, a shift in our energy. True. She's gonna <laughs> she's gonna talk about it right away in that place. And uh, I am listening to that and I'm thinking to myself. He's being a good listener because introverts are uh, oftentimes. I'm thinking to myself, okay, <laughs> I, I don't want to respond in a wrong way yeah. here. I want to make sure every word that's going to come out of my mouth is going to be the right word. And I if don't think that at all. Some, some, <laughs> some, some, of, uh, some of you spouses totally get, get yes. what I'm saying. Like you don't want to end up saying something that you're going to regret later. Yeah. And a lesson that I've learned in our marriage and also in, in my working relationships with people, I had a really good friend of mine was highly introverted, more so than Joel. Um, and I would feel a shift in our working relationship or something would happen at work where there was maybe communica miscommunication or just a bump in the road or conflict. And I would overwhelm her with my verbal processing. And I would want to fix it. I want to know what I did yeah. wrong. What can we do better? So I would just talk, 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 talk. And I could feel her just walls going up. Some of the eyes out there totally know yeah, what she's saying, right? I overwhelm you. I understand. Um, and so what I had to learn about her was I had to give her space to process and think. And oftentimes I learned the cues but she would always circle back around with me a day or two later and say, hey, I've thought about this situation and I'm ready to talk about it or I'm ready to process it out. And that was really powerful for me to learn, don't be overwhelming and give them the space that they need to process that information. Now, where extroverts have to work on this mm -hmm. is Extroverts, you've got to give introverts space and time. Yeah. Don't overwhelm them with your verbal processing. Yeah. Introverts, you got to let extroverts process. But 
for introverts, when you've processed that information, you have to circle back around and have that conversation yeah. or you're not going to grow. Because I think sometimes introverts will just bottle it up and they don't want to talk about it. And that never brings closure. Yeah. You know, if you're an eye out there and you're ever in a big social gathering, uh, you know it can be just wilting. And yeah. so <laughs> if, if those of you who are E's out there... Don't just think your spouse is shy if they're an extrovert. Yeah. Sometimes it just takes all the internal emotional energy to be at a party yeah. or a big event or something like that. And and oftentimes eyes will try to seek the seek each other out in a <laughs> in party like in and, and like go and sit and chat and be like, okay, let's just relieve <laughs> ourselves from all these social butterflies. But it's just a difference. It's just a difference yeah. of how we're also energized. So ease out there that have beautiful eyes help and if they engage for a little bit just know that they are doing celebrate them the very great. best job ever yeah they're doing great so our next personality uh letter that signifies it the two things that it signifies is sensing versus intuition now sensing they move and often present and take in information in a sequential order and it's also step by step yes. where your <laughs> intuition or the n it takes in and um, shares information in like a big picture or a snapshot kind of a way. Yeah, absolutely. So for S's, for sensing, I'm an S, Joel is an N, he's yes. intuition. So sensing, we love facts and details. They're very important. And we oftentimes process information A to B, B to C, C to D, until we get to the big picture. So we process information so and ideas and details. Yeah, um, ends we would go um, not A to B, B to C. We would yeah. go A, B, <laughs> Y, Z. We, we're, we're the arc. We're the big picture snapshot of the, let's do this. Yeah. And here's what it's going to do for people. And here's how we're going to help the world. Yeah, ends think very much in big picture. They're interested in doing new and different, exciting things. They oftentimes move on to the next vision quickly while S's are still working like, wait, I'm at C or I'm at D. Like I haven't gotten to D or Z yet. Um, and so it's interesting to see like when you process these two personalities yeah. and they come together, how it can make for a very interesting... Yeah. Let, me, let me give you an example, a quick one. When we first got married, I would yes. like float out these big dreams and Casey would be thinking in her mind, well, if we're going to be doing that, we're going to have to do one. These are all the work we're going to have to do, all the logistics. And she would begin to get stressed out. I interpreted that as she do, she doesn't really care for my dreams. Like yes. she is riddling my dreams with reality. Yeah. And so one time when I, we, I was still in law school, we were almost finishing. We we had just written a book. Uh, we had our first child, yeah. and I got this letter from Harvard Divinity School. Now this <laughs> this is something that that I'm like, well, I at least need to check out this oh, option. Geez. You know, I need to. Thank so we you. went out. We spent some time at, at I in Cambridge. I did good in the moment, though. I wasn't like, you are crazy, but that's what I was thinking in my mind. But well, I didn't say. Thank you, thank you for being <laughs> so so kind. But then we began to think about you know the logistics of like, okay, how are we going to move to Cambridge? Uh, with their new child. Now, I thought or, about that the day he got the letter in the mail and said he was interested. I was like, I knew all the facts and details of what this would mean. But I needed to explore it out. <laughs> and, um, and here's where the strength kind of came out. I didn't yes. end up going to Harvard Divinity yet. No, I, I didn't end up going. <laughs> I didn't end up going. But um, part of it was she helped me to say, okay, well, if we're going to actually do that, do we, are we ready for this, uh, these sacrifices yeah. and these, you know, opportunities? And is this the time in the season of what our it, life? Yeah. Realistically, what does this look like? And I think that that was a really important lesson that Joel and I had to learn through this process of the way we process information mm -hmm. differently because he would see it in a big picture and I would see it in details. And so we had to learn, I had to not overwhelm him right away when he had a big idea or a dream that he wanted to do. I couldn't overwhelm him with all the details. I had to hold back, let it land on him, let him kind of mm -hmm. process it out. 
And Joel had to learn to say to me, so true. Hey, I'm not saying yeah. this is what I want to do. I have to preface it. I have to say, yes. okay, I'm not saying this is like, this is just a vision or a dream that would be a great opportunity or potential. Yeah. And I have to preface it. It helps when I preface yeah. it. And he also had to sit on things and pray about them before he shared them with me. Sorry, our dog is in here. <laughs> we quarantined. <laughs> we are scratching at the door. Now let's talk about thinker versus feeler. T versus yep. F. A thinker makes decisions by stepping back and making an objective, taking an objective view and making yeah. an objective decision. Feelers, when they're gonna make a decision, they step in <laughs> to the big to the picture and Me. put themselves in the other person's shoes and they empathize. Yes, majorly empathize. I'm super high on the feeler side of you things. You truly are. And Joel, I think, is kind of middle of the road, thinker, feeler. Um, oftentimes thinkers, they analyze the pros and cons and they're very consistent and logical. They make decisions with their head and oftentimes want to be fair. Um, they care Which is about a good the, attribute. It's, it's a great attribute. I mean, it's a great attribute. Um, truth telling is more important than being tactful as opposed to feelers who it would be the opposite, being tactful is more important than telling yeah. the cold truth. Yeah. And they oftentimes, like for feelers, they, they empathize, like they put themselves in people's shoes and care very much about him, how information is gonna land on someone. It's true. Remember that one college roommate who oh, was Lord. more on the thinking side? Yes. And you were on the feeling side? Yes, and I'm so high on the feeling side, I would like, make up stories about people like we would be leaving so our funny. apartment in college and i would see like a dad taking his daughter to like throw out the trash before he took her to school and i would be like oh i wonder if he's a single dad i wonder what happened and she would be like you are a weirdo casey like you don't even know those people so but funny. i just empathize i always wonder about people's lives and put myself in their shoes and and you there's every person an individual is important you, yes. you it's not just like hey one size fits all Never. it's like what is your situation Never. and how can i best help craft this for this individual. Yes, absolutely. And that can be really interesting when you think about how you communicate together in your marriage, whether you're both feelers, you're both thinkers, or one is a thinker, one is a feeler. Yeah, and, and the people that I coach, my marriage coaching clients, this is the biggest kind of rough spot yes. where you have a feeler who oftentimes expresses what they're feeling and they they um, want that closeness by the the feeling and not just being objective yeah or um but they they want to express themselves in that all or nothing way yeah. and so sometimes they'll say you always do this yeah. this is their big <laughs> rough spot you that's always how they feel we always do this but the thinker is like hey I, i'm not that is not true i am not owning anything that isn't true yeah for me and so the the thinker often comes off harsh and not empathetic at all and the feeler often comes off to the thinker who's thinking, that is totally irrational. Yeah. I don't even understand what you're saying. But the cool thing is, is when you do have a thinker and you have a feeler, man, your family is so set up to be balanced. Yes, especially absolutely. like when it comes to like our daughter. And this has kind of yeah. been like in the morning time, I, I usually take a thinker approach like with our kids. And Lincoln is a thinker. And it's, I'm like, he's Lincoln, very logical, it's time very to get fair. up. You know, you're going to be late for school. But with my daughter, who's more of a feeler, it's a totally different scenario. Yes. You have to be, you always, always, always with her have to think through how it's going to land on her. And it, you can just cold hard truth to Lincoln. Get up. It's time to go to school. He's up downstairs. Time to go to school. But with Reagan, you have to take a different approach. Information lands on her very differently. Yeah. And so Joel would come in, Reagan, it's time to get up, get downstairs, eat your breakfast. Yeah. And mornings would end in meltdowns and fits and I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on my parenting all the time especially with her but I had to tell him like if you come in and you rub her back and you rub her feet and you slowly wake her up and then let her know that her dogs are waiting for her at the bottom of the <laughs> stairs it's something that she looks forward to it's so you know what I do now her. you know what I do now 
I rub her back, <laughs> I rub her feet, and I tell her that her dogs are waiting for her downstairs. And it's a much better a morning. A much better experience. Because I'm learning to think and to feel and to empathize and to put myself and to speak her language. Yeah. And this beautiful relationship can blossom yes. when you understand that. Yeah. Now we're going to move to our last personality types. It's judging versus perceiving. Yeah. Now, a judging, they like to use a planned approach to meeting a deadline in a scheduled way. <laughs> and the perceiver likes to use a spontaneous approach to meeting a deadline <laughs> with a flurry of energy yes. and movement leading right up to that deadline. Yeah. Oftentimes, oftentimes J's, like if you think about a project that you're given for 30 days to plan it, right? You have 30 days to complete yeah. the project. Yeah. Oftentimes J's will find their inspiration, their motivation, their organization in the beginning half of that 30 yeah, day so deadline. True day one to 15 or maybe day five to day 20, whatever it is, earlier on you'll find your energy. They're planners. They love information in an orderly fashion. But P's find their motivation, their energy, their inspiration as the deadline approaches. Yes. Oftentimes P's are really good under pressure. And I think this can oftentimes be one of the biggest personality <laughs> conflicts because yeah, judges can yeah. judge a P, you're a procrastinator, you know, they judge them because they're so last minute. Like this is called being an adult. Yes. You need to, you need to get your stuff together Yes. and get on board. But <laughs> can I just say this, a P, our P, our temptation, as we look at J's, we think to ourselves, Stop nagging. Yeah. We say stop to ourselves. Stop controlling. Yeah, stop controlling and, and, <coughs> Excuse me. and stop being so rigid and start living. Yeah. Like, let's be in the moment. Let's take life as it comes a little bit. Yeah. And so you've got these two different sides to it. And you can either look at it as a weakness, like you need to get your stuff together or you need to stop controlling. Or you can look at it and say, how does this become an asset? for our family. Yeah, absolutely. And I think some of the ways we've had to learn to navigate that is I am very much a planner. And so she I is. have to learn to leave room for spontaneity. Everything cannot be controlled and that is okay. So I will plan as much as possible and then we're going to leave just about 20% for be spontaneous. Things are not going to go the way that you planned and that's going to be okay. And I have to learn to be okay with that. That's something I've had to learn over the years. Not be so rigid, be spontaneous, have fun, relax a little bit. Um, and, I, and I, on the other hand, yes. have had to say, okay, I know that my wife, she is a planner. Yeah. And so how can I get the information out to her as soon as possible instead of leaving it in my mind? Another um, trait of a P is that we love to have our options open to the very last yes. minute. We, we, we don't want to commit exactly. We, we want to see which of these are going to be the best Drive opportunity me. at the time. Crazy. So, so I, if I'm going to work together and synergize with Casey, I've got to start bringing those things as Even soon as I can. Even if it's just an idea that he doesn't know is going to, hey, I don't know if I'm going to be out of town on this weekend, but it's a possibility. Yeah. So and so we have to, there's a third way. It's not her way. Yeah. It's not my way. It's coming together. It's that old Genesis chapter two yes. where God invents Marriage, he says, you know, to paraphrase, the, the son's going to leave mom and dad. They're going to leave and cleave, you know, to their wife. So there's this, and the two will become one, yes. bone of bone, flesh of flesh, <laughs> all of that. So there's not, it's not Casey's way. It's not yeah. my way. It's a third way. It's a synergistic way yep. of taking the best of our strengths and helping to cover our weaknesses. Yeah, I learned this. And the other thing that's important to know about a P is they're really good under pressure. And oh, I learned a really I'll, big, I'll <laughs> I learned a really big lesson in this when I had like planned out everything. I had spreadsheets, I had role descriptions, I had diagrams, color-coded diagrams. Yeah. 
And oftentimes when it doesn't go according to plan, I don't think as quick on my feet. Like I'm still stuck in the fact that my plan didn't work or something happened that messed up my plan. That's when peas are fantastic because they can jump in. They're great under pressure. They think very quick on their feet Mm -hmm. and they can come in and just reformat the pieces of your plan very well together. So that's a great way that you can utilize an S and a P together. And another thing that's good is false deadlines. Like sure. giving them false deadlines. They mm-hmm. may not know. It doesn't, I guess that doesn't mean like technically lying. Well, well uh, just to give you an example, like I've always worked for P's and I am a P. Yeah. So I remember. I've always worked for P's too. <laughs> so when I work for P's, I know this about, I know this weakness about me and this is vulnerability based trust. You have to admit yeah. your weakness. I know this weakness about me. So I would tell my boss who is a P, hey, the deadline is five days yes. before the deadline. I wouldn't actually tell him that part. But I would say, oh, it's due yeah. five days before the end of the month. And so what would happen on the last day at about 10 p.m., my boss would say, give me the first half and say, here, I'll have the rest to you later tonight. And yeah. it would be fine because we still had five more totally. days cushion to work all of the details out. So help a pee out and uh, give him a false deadline. Yeah. So we've kind of unpacked a lot of information when it comes to personality test. And again, as we understood more and more, and you can read on it at 16personalities.com, you can dive more into the different personalities, but you can see how no longer are you trying to make your spouse think or process information like you. You understand that's the way God designed them to be. He gave them that specific personality. He gave me the specific personality that I have. Now, that's not to say that we don't need to work on our weaknesses, yeah. but you can see how understanding those things about your spouse can it's, really help you in communication and conflict. It's the natural way that we normally think. Yeah. So if you're a feeler and you're empathetic, you can. it doesn't mean that you can't learn to think logically. Absolutely. It just means that these are the way that you naturally go about your life. These are the way that is your normal wiring, yes. and it's your areas of strength. Yeah. And so use your strengths and not your weaknesses. In marriage, the temptation is to focus on the differences as weaknesses and the liabilities and saying, why can't you be more like me? But love isn't about making someone in your own image. Love is about living for another person's benefit and knowing who they are and and being strong where they're weak and working together as a team so that your team, your marriage can thrive and prosper. We pray that this vulnerability lesson, this uh, vulnerability-based trust would happen in your marriage. And that's what Myers-Briggs does. It says, okay, everyone has strengths. Everyone has weaknesses. You are psychologically no one wired is better than this the other. way. So acknowledge your weaknesses yeah. and be vulnerable and work together. And your marriage is about to synergize and go to a whole new level. Yes. And something that's really fun as you in this video is to dive in and discover more about your personality type and your spouse's personality yeah. type. And then talk about your differences. Um, talk about the different ways that you're wired and try to help one another understand that a little bit better. So we have an activity for you. A few questions to yep. start you down that road of the discussion of Meyer, Myers-Briggs and your personality. So check out those questions. And next week, date number three, we're going to be talking about fight night heroes. How conflict. to take your <laughs> conflict and reduce the time of your conflict. And when what we discovered in these little tools that we that we have yes. is that you can reduce that conflict time yeah. by about 90%. So yeah. we're excited to <laughs> he, share those. He's excited about that. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, yes. Every... Just how to better navigate through conflict, really, and communicate better when you're in the heat of an argument. So we'll see you next date night. God bless. Until next time. See you next week. Bye. Bye.